So if we look at this one right here. Okay. <clears throat> okay. What you see here <clears throat> is this is the uh, southern shaft opening, which has uh, particular significance uh, to the theory, the microwave theory. Okay. The... Uh, this is an opening in the south wall, and it's directly opposite an opening in the north wall. It's right here. Okay? Mm hmm So this opening here um, has a dimensions of 8.4 by 4.8 inches. Oh, wow. So the... Um, generally, the guidelines for creating a waveguide... Uh, are the the height the is about half half the width of the length. So what is know. a waveguide? A waveguide carries microwaves. And what is that used for today commercially? Uh, communications for the most part. Like for example, what? Oh, just about everything that we get. I mean, you got these microwave towers. Uh, Try and pull up uh, a microwave horn antenna on the internet. Okay. So you have those. Uh, they're all different shapes and sizes. And, you know, there is a... Obviously, I, I don't work in the microwave industry. So where so where is the like, waveguide here? So okay. that's, a, that's a horn antenna with a waveguide, right? And there are some where you have curvatures on the interior surface but you see the waveguide itself the the horn is uh receives a broader signal and then narrows it down to the uh to the waveguide and transmits it through a waveguide okay all right so that's what we're looking at when we when we're seeing those little shafts the the dimensions of those are if you if you believe what i'm telling you okay right <laughs> i believe it man i believe you <laughs> So when I saw that, it was like, okay, that looks like a horn antenna, right? <clears throat> and that's in the south south wall of the, the King's Chain. But directly opposite is a, a shaft mm -hmm. where the width is uh, uh, almost twice the, di the dimension of the height. So you, you do have that rectangular kind of opening. It's 4.8 okay. high and 8.4 inches. Okay. So essentially the, the width uh, has to be related to the wavelength of the uh, atoms that are used uh, to create the microwave signal. Okay. Okay. And the wavelength of hydrogen is 21 centimeters or 8.309 inches so it's almost 8.4 inches close so if you had like if you had a uh a, some kind of a liner in there maybe gold-plated liner uh then you would have a, a just a Ah, so if these things could have been plated or or, or coated on on the surface, yeah, it would yeah, be a little yeah, smaller. But, but yeah, it would be just a little small. So it, it would be, be it's the perfect dimensions for a waveguide for hydrogen. It's very very close. Well, I mean, just uh, as it is, it's close. Okay. But they they could be lined now. Uh, <clears throat> of course, you know, critics will say, well, there has been no nothing found in in the uh, archaeological record that would indicate that those things even existed, ever existed. And that's, and that's maybe true, except for one uh, plate that was found by uh, Pering and Petrie on the south side of the uh, uh, Great Pyramid near the shaft, and that is a, a an iron plate. And on one surface of this iron plate there is a uh, signs of uh, gold uh, that it was gold plated at one time so there's two shafts going out of the king's chamber right which is in the upper middle of the pyramid 
Right. And so, yeah, H and J on this diagram. Right. These are what we were just looking at, these wave guides. Right. Allegedly. Um, and one of them brings something in, and then it goes through the king's chamber, and then the other one shoots it out. No, well, something happens in between. Yeah, something happens in between inside that king's chamber, G. Right. What happens inside the king's chamber? Okay, so inside the king's chamber, what you have is a, <clears throat> um, it's a resonant chamber. The fascinating features of the king's chamber uh, that the it's constructed of granite, uh, red uh, or pink granite from Aswan. Is that unique for other the cha for the other cha chambers in the pyramid? Uh, yeah, that's, this is the only chamber in the pyramid that has granite. Okay. So the uh, the granite was brought from Aswan, uh, which is five hundred miles away. Okay. From where the pyramid is. How out. much granite is in that chamber? Oh, thousands of tons. Thousands of tons of granite. You're talking, yeah, you're talking thousands of tons. The, there are like 40, 43 uh, beams uh, above the, the uh, chamber itself. Those 43 beams weigh between 45 and 70 tons each. Are you talking about those beams that are above the chamber? Right. The uh, the beams are, uh, are said to be uh, uh, relieving chambers. You know, they're stacked in a series above. There's mm -hmm. five layers uh, and, a, and a space between each one. Mm -hmm. And it looks like the bottom of those, the beams are perfectly square on the bottom and edges, and the tops of them are very rough. Right. And uh, so... In the Giza power plant, I propose that those beams were intentionally made that way, um, and it wasn't a lack of attention, rather than it was a uh, very specific focused attention mm -hmm. on the beams to make sure that they were tuned to a particular frequency when struck. So you have... You have a situation where the uh, sound input into that chamber or vibration into that chamber mm -hmm. would resonate, would cause the granite to resonate, and the beams above would resonate also to those frequencies. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and the other interesting thing about the uh, the king's chamber assembly is that um, it is totally separate from the core masonry. You know, in a structure, you would uh, like tie things, tie, tie things into the, the core masonry or the core structure for stability and stuff like that. There is a space um, all around the, 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 the king's chamber separating it from the, the limestone blocks that, uh, comprise the core chamber. Really? Uh, right. So uh, <clears throat> you have that particular uh, particular feature. Uh, Tom Danley, who was a, an acoustic engineer, uh, he did some acoustic testing in uh, 1997, I believe it was at the time he went over there. And he... Uh, he he reported that he had uh, he was testing doing a sweep at very very low frequencies, very low frequencies, uh, infrasonic, and the uh, the frequencies that he picked up were forming an F sharp chord, so they were musical in nature. The F sharp is considered to be the or by the Hopi Indians tune their flutes to the F sharp chord. They they consider it to be the the, the voice of Mother Earth. It is the frequency of the earth. <laughs>